Rocksteady by Aretha Franklin. The girl who wanted to be God by the Manix last on the chain. If you can think of something that links into that, do it pronto, please. 64046, Radcliffe. at bbc.co.uk. Uh, earlier in the autumn, a couple of months back, Suede released their eighth studio album. It's called The Blue Hour. Uh, I think it's right up there with the very best things that they've ever done. And uh, Brett and Matt are here for me to f- ladle some more idle. Very on. Hello. Yeah, we can <laughs> keep, keep ladling. Keep, keep it coming. Keep, keep that's, that's, yeah, we can. We never get bored of hearing stuff like that. I know. mean it though, guys. I think Thank it you. is right up there with the best stuff you've done. I mean. Well, let's talk about... The, let me talk about the title. I, I said earlier on that I've listened to this record a couple of times on walks in sort of deserted or semi-deserted city streets and suburban streets at twilight, which feels perfect. It is a twilight record, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's kind of... <laughs> it's supposed to... The, the, the title's supposed to be a kind of... The, the blue hour is actually that time of day when the kind of, you know, between between um daylight and, and night time yeah where kind of like you know the, the darkness is closing in so it's supposed to have that sort of almost that sense of threat about the title but a kind of like a i don't know not n- n- nothing specific just this sort of like uh, sort of like sense of sort of uh, sort of something about to happen that's not necessarily yeah. particularly pleasant well it, yeah. it has that there's, an un- there's a deeply unsettling mood about it that you can't quite put your finger on and i know you've said brett that it, that it hints at a narrative without making one explicit yeah yeah, exactly. I think as soon as you have an explicit narrative, it becomes a concept album, which it yeah. absolutely isn't. No. It's just, there's just themes. There's, there's a fine line between having kind of like strong, strong narrative sort of themes in a record and creating a, com- a concept album. It really isn't that. But um, lots of the, you know, the point of, lots of the songs are from sort of a child's point of view. So that's yeah. if there's anything that links it together. I, I think it's quite important uh, to have themes that link records together as i get older i kind of quite like that discipline when i was younger i think i just used to sort of throw songs together and whatever stuck stuck but i yeah. kind of quite like that discipline as i get older yeah i mean i was thinking about this when i was thinking about the record that there are some records that don't have a narrative but have a mood i mean the beatles white album is one of those and i think i compared it to that in something that i wrote that there is a there is a definitely an eerie mood about that record and there's an eerie mood about this sometimes they don't there doesn't need to be a narrative just a, a, a mood and is that something as a band that you feel, you know, that you want from a record, the sense of a, of a, you know, a coherent kind of mood that's conjured. I think so. I, I think that that's how you lose yourself in it. Yeah. You know, what once you end up with a kind of these these, you know, albums that are written for Spotify playlists. You know what I mean? With lots of collaborators. Yeah. You're always getting taken out of the record. You know what I mean? You're always being kind of forced to to think about something else or someone else or a different style. So I think you know, if if you're going to make a record that's that you can sit and listen to for 45 minutes it has to have that kind of coherence to it you know that that idea of, of creating a world and keep creating a sense of place and almost creating characters that, that you live with for that time yeah i mean i you know i, I'm, I can listen to abba gold as happily as the next man and i don't <laughs> mind i don't mind records sometimes that are collections of simply great Mm. tunes but with this i find that i don't i don't want to you know I, I want to have the time to listen to it because it feels like that sustained mood is the best way of enjoying it having said that i want to play a couple of tracks completely out of context <laughs> which i think will stand up very well this is absolutely when i first heard the i must admit when i first heard the record this immediately stood out as an, and it's an amazing uh, piece of music wastelands <laughs> From the album The Blue Hour, uh, the current album by Suede, which is a remarkable thing. That is uh, Wastelands. Brett and Matt are with me to discuss it. Um, and, and we'll come on to Suede, the Insatiable Ones, an extraordinary, equally extraordinary documentary that was on Sky. It's filmed by Mike Christie that was... Uh, was shown at the weekend and it's going to be available on DVD next year. Um, literary critics used to talk about a thing when they reviewed the novels of Graham Greene called Greenland, which was this slightly chilly world of moral ambiguity and stuff. I, then I love that you get that vibe from his, his books. And, uh, and there, is a, there is definitely a place called Suede World, isn't there? Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's, it's somewhere that I, I think I sort of I personally have been working on for the last sort of 26 years or so, but only really kind of realised where it was quite recently. It's a sort of... Uh, I, I suppose at times I've been guilty of drifting it too far into Suede World, and that can result in self-parody. 
but it's it's a kind of it's a sort of an interesting liminal place mm. sort of like between some flyovers and kind <laughs> of like by a hard shoulder sort of thing you know it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a, it's a sort of space where i don't think anyone else really wants to go and that no one else really wants to document <laughs> and we keep dragging them there yeah exactly <laughs> except possibly jg ballard he's poss- possibly Just the only person that ever wanted to go there and and that but now we're the kind of uh, the only people that kind of like you know have, yeah. have, have, have got a flame for it you know the, and and the film the film which is a remarkable thing it's a couple of hours long it heard on it heard at the weekend i i uh, watched it over last night and this morning and you'll be able to get a three disc dvd of it in april i mean it, it begins with kind of your friendship in what is a literal i guess literally a manifestation of suede world in a way and that it is in haywood seat being a place whose kind of anonymity in some ways is at the heart of what you do is that right I suppose it is, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, everything that, that I've written, all the words I've written have always been kind of like a document of the world I saw around me, but at the same time kind of like an escape from that, I suppose. So, yeah, all, all, my whole, I spent my whole, the first 18 years of my life trying to escape from Hayward's Heath, so it's um, <laughs> definitely going to make it, make it into the song somehow, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and, and, I think, and I think in the... Uh, it, it, in the documentary, uh, Matt, your your brother uh, Richard, now languishing in obscurity somewhere, uh, he 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 makes the point, I think, which the, the, through all the travails and various things that happens that are chronicled in this in this film, your 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 relationship is kind of key, isn't it? Because and that's partly because of that shared sense of place and belonging and beginning. I think it's a, a shared idea of what a band should be and what yeah. they should do. You know, more than anything, you know, it's kind of. I think it's growing up obsessed with with music as a as an escape from where you're from and and almost as a, a way of life you know it's some, something that I don't know whether you get from bands anymore I kind of looked to you know for better or for worse to to people like the Smiths and the Teardrop Explodes for, for how to live my life yeah, yeah. you know what I mean yeah I do um, and I think that's something that comes from you know coming from a place that's very bland and isn't surrounded by interesting strong characters yeah i think your point in the in in the documentary that you made about the about you know brit pop and and all of these bands when when we you were first writing about it in the early days it been it, been, it being about the suburbs the revenge yeah. of the suburbs was the was the was the phrase that you used and i think that's pretty pertinent um point actually it was all it was very much about the suburbs it wasn't big city music at all no no and, and i think we try and make i try and make that point in the thing that what what the, the monster it became three years later was not at all what it was in yes. mine and your imaginations then where it was this eccentric english outsiderdom in a way you know absolutely but this, that always happens doesn't yeah. it to all kind of you know to all kind of movements they always start off interesting and then they <laughs> become kind of bloated and misshapen as soon as the kind of as soon as the money moves in and as, yeah. soon, as soon as it moves into the into the mainstream you know yeah. all these things like punk and anything really it just becomes a self-parody after a while punk was exactly the one i thought of when i was trying to justify my usage of that phrase because i was thinking it'd be, it's a bit like saying that you know the, the limp biscuits or green day were punk you know what i mean the, the word had changed its meaning completely by the then year you know punk broke yeah yeah, it's yeah. Um, i can hear and this is not and this is not meant this is meant as an absolute compliment i can hear the passage of time from the drones to the blue hour on the blue hour do you know what i mean i can hear that it's the same band with many many years behind them since the but in a good way in the way that a, an author would have that passage of time that you have grown up and matured and taken on board some stuff dark light triumph victory all those things i think it's really important for a band to have an identity yeah to, to have a to have a sort of strong sort of identity it's not to not just be try and be everything to every man because you can't be you know there's there's not enough time there's not enough you haven't got enough uh, you can't make enough albums and I, I kind of quite like bands that sort of have a strong bands like interpol or someone like that mm. they kind of like they just sort of they have an identity and there's nothing wrong with that they don't sort of try and sort of become loads of different bands i think doing that that with, with the with there's an inertia to bands that kind of like that that that, that stops you from doing that and I, I think it's quite important for bands to 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 have some sort of like space that they live in and we live in this sort of like very un- unpleasant space called Sweden. 
<laughs> you make a good point, Matt, in the documentary. So that occurred to me when I was, I, 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 not, I was trying to struggle towards thinking when I was listening to the record for the first time. You said that it's a very pure record, that it's kind of distilled to an essence of, of, of suede. Even though it's a big record, it's an expansive record, it's got strings on it, it's got an orchestral interest. It has a kind of line, it's got a kind of clarity of thought about it. Well, I mean, one of the things is we're kind of independent in a way that we haven't been since, like, 1992. Yeah. You know what I mean? We make the records ourselves. We, we pay for the recording. We don't have anyone looking our, over our shoulders. Yeah. We're not aiming for kind of A-list on Radio 1 or anything. Yeah. So suddenly you're faced with this, this blank sheet of paper, this blank studio, and you just go, oh, what would I like to hear? And which is exactly how you start out. You literally, it's kind of like, what, what records would I like to hear that don't exist? Right, I'll make them. And it's almost, in a weird way, it's like, it's like being kind of 18 again. Yeah. But with, you know, but with a bad back. <laughs> I think when you get, you know, what happens to bands when they get... It's, it's really interesting, the kind of like the, the, the narrative arc of a, of a band's kind of like life sp lifespan, you know. It's very, very predictable. It's almost like the life cycle of a frog or something like that, you know. It's, it's from, from sort of like frog spawn to tadpole to frog. It's kind of, you know, bands start off and it, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a there's a kind of like a, a, a chapter of struggle and yeah. then, then uh, success and then excess and yeah. then, 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 then disintegration sort of thing. Uh, and ba every band, when they become successful, they end up kind of like chasing their tails. They end up trying to recreate formulas and trying to recreate successes. And um, I think if they, after you've been around for, for a long, long time, which kind of we have now, um, you, you sort of, you kind of realise that and you kind of start making music for the right reasons again. I think, you know, we're back at towards the tail end of when it all went wrong for Suede, we were making music for the wrong reasons, mm. you know, and, and I feel as though... We're kind of we we're sort of yeah. We're, it feels like we're doing it for the right for the right yeah. reasons now. The, the film's remarkable in many ways. Some, some of its strengths are well. For one thing, there is the remarkable archive of, of the, you know. I was amazed at what I was seeing, thinking presumably back in the day you were very annoyed at, at Simon and Mike for filming. It seems every movement you made, but no, you must be quite delighted about it. Yeah, it's exactly that. I mean, at the time, <laughs> there's a reason why kind of three quarters of the film is is people showing two fingers to Simon. Because well, it's the, mainly you. Yeah. Yeah. They, they should no, they, they should be a kind of collection of just of, but, of, of you showing your fingers. But, yeah. but but everyone Sticking. does at some point. And yeah, it was it was it was really frustrating. You know, he was constantly constantly, constantly doing hungover mainly. You yeah, know what I mean, he, you know, just in airports or something. Yeah. yeah, there's probably about sort of 18 hours of <laughs> a, 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 of a potential DVD extra of just us sitting around slumped. In in airports which yeah. possibly no one in the world wants to see but but so, i mean the thing is he, he did capture everything and he does know where everything is i mean it is incredible yeah. you know he was he was very involved in the edit and mike would be saying to him oh you know have you got is there is there a clip of brett throwing something at someone <laughs> and he'd be like yes it crops up in three places <laughs> 1995 at, uh, backstage you know it's it's it he, he's he has got absolutely everything yeah. in, and it, i think it adds a kind of um um, I don't know, kind of honesty yeah, to the absolutely. whole thing. It's it's so easy when you look back on these things to look back in with rose tinted spectacles and then but if you're kind of confronted with yourself yeah, at those times, at you can't time. really be like that. I think as well that it's important that the, the, the sort of backstory, that the fact that Mike uh, Christie, the director, yeah. is is is, ha, is kind of he's an old friend, um, and he's been there, uh, kind of you know, with us, live you know, living the, the, our mm. career with us for for the last twenty five years, and I think because of that. We felt as though we could tr we could trust him a lot with with lots of the um, with lots of the with lots of the interviews and lots of the you know when we're kind of like we're talking about where we went wrong and yeah. stuff you know I felt as though I could be much more confessional with him than I would maybe be able to be with someone that I didn't know so sure. I felt as I could trust him and uh, I think that's a really important element to the film. People that have seen it have said how 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 they're kind of like struck by a sense of us just being straight about it, straight you know, where about we it. where we went wrong and where we went right. And I think it's really important to admit you admit you. Admit you Admit your, mis admit your mistakes. Well, 
uh, you know, people can go and see the movie. I'm not going to uh, go and watch the the, uh, the documentary. I'll get it on the DVD. So I'm not going to go over all that now. But what I will say is that when you do talk about the uh, about what went wrong, and you talk about Brett, the you know the lifestyle, shall we say, issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. Quote unquote. <laughs> quote unquote. But then there's a moment. There's a bit. There's lo- There's lots of candor and really honest and illuminating candor and rawness in it, which is brilliant. And there's a particular bit I do when you're in the ICA, all of you together, mm. which feels incredibly raw and new. Like you might have been talking about that stuff for the first time is that i think we probably were yeah, yeah. i mean there's a there's a kind of weird thing with with, with with bands when you've been in a band with someone people for a long time you sort of you, you you're incredibly close in one way but in another way yeah. you don't talk about lots of things lots of lo- the way you communicate is through kind of in jokes and stuff like that and so facing real uh, real things that you know kind of like emotional things that happened between us like when we split up for god's sake in 2003 yeah. it was a pretty big thing yeah that was the first time we'd sat down as a band really and talked about it even when we actually split up in 2003 i don't really remember having a particularly long conversation about it it was just a sort of like it, it was just like it, it felt as though it had come to an end yeah. and i think that that moment when we were in the ica talking about that was the first time we'd we'd, we'd really addressed it for, yeah. for many years uh, on a lighter note then before we hear another excellent piece of music um gareth in hove says i was at college with matt and brett and i was in a band with them can you ask them when the lost jeff tapes are being released oh my god gareth yeah, the, perry gareth, gareth perry. perry hi gareth yeah well gareth uh, perry's got a lovely lovely voice actually has he it's kind of like a he, he was like a young george michael he had he has probably still a yeah, fantastic right. singing voice well and he should he should definitely you know well do gareth something with that him. sounds to me like the, the lost jeff tapes are going to be imminently he, really put, put it this he way he hasn't got them we he he was <laughs> always a much better singer than me and probably <laughs> oh. still is so uh, darren wilshaw says could you ask brett and matt if they would consider i don't know what this program is celebrity pointless slim jim <laughs> phantom and glenn matlock were on the other day so it's the rock star thing to do you know I'd, you be, I'd, I'd be so embarrassed if i lost would you Ooh, which i would do you know what i mean <laughs> i would immediately go to pieces as i always do in those situations so so okay. yeah and pat brooks says tell brett and matt the new record is the most beautiful tragic piece of music brackets yes i listened to it as one piece of music i've heard in years i've listened to it continually since i bought it the words of music seem as they were written for me even though i know they weren't i can't hear it enough uh well, thank, thank you thank very you. much it very is kind. it is a it is a remarkable thing i suppose in the interest of, of sonic diversity i should have played one of the tracks that show the showcase the orchestra but i just wanted to play this beyond the outskirts because i love this as well and because you totally go full black sabbath in the middle <laughs> <laughs> which is a <laughs> full full midlands we said at the time is that what you said that, that's what the section was called what on, was on the, on oh, the I'm computer s- i'm so glad i've got we're thinking along the same from the same <laughs> hymn sheet um it's an in- incredible record guys well done thanks for doing thank this you, thank you thank right. you bye bye take bye. care cheers <laughs> Suede, the insatiable once the documentary was broadcast at the weekend on Sky Arts. And if you have the facilities, you can get it on Catch Up TV. And uh, it's also going to be available as a three-disc DVD in April of next year. You can pre-order it now. It's incredible, as is the album The Blue Hour from what, uh, from work. That track comes suede beyond the outskirts. Six, six, music. There are no rules. You can use paint, crayons, pencil, clay, wood, glitter, whatever comes to hand. There are no restrictions on the subject. Follow your imagination.